Hi, everybody. Tom Hall here, Executive Director, Montclair Film, the Montclair Film Festival. Thank you so much for joining us for The Antidote and for our Q&A with the directors of the film. Please welcome John Hoffman. Hello, Tom. Hello. And Kahani Cooperman. Hi, Tom. I'm so excited Hi. to be here. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here, too. Yeah, we're, we're all excited to be in these little boxes. <laughs> it's, it's such a weird year. Um, so I wanted to start by asking you guys uh, first how you came to know one another as collaborators and uh, decided to undertake the antidote as a project together. Well, I'll take that one, Tom. Um, I am so grateful to Dawn Porter and Fisher Stevens for independently um, telling me that I have to meet the honey. I had um, reached out to both of them saying that I am talking to different filmmakers. I knew um, that in this film, this journey I was going to start on in making this film, that I wanted to have a co-director, that the nature of the film required more than one sort of point of view and worldview. And um, so I was asking people I know and respect um, for ideas, and they both said, you've got to meet Kahani. Um, and so we had breakfast um, in New York in the West Village, and I just knew, like, I'm going to make this film with this woman. And so we had a great conversation. And the next morning, we spoke again, and we said, let's do it. Yeah. It was oatmeal. Oatmeal, and then suddenly a film was happening. But I really responded to, um, to this idea of making a film about kindness, which is really the only word we had to start with, um, especially at a time uh, two and a half years ago, where I personally uh, felt rocked by, uh, you know, this pervasive feeling of civility just crumbling. And so the opportunity to work with John, who I had never met but had heard about, and and have this, uh, you know, opportunity to explore this idea at this time in our history, I thought was, you know, really incredible. And also I was really excited for the opportunity to make a feature, which, um, which uh, I felt like was my next, my next, you know, dream move. So this was an incredible opportunity all around. And, and so we, we started the task of wrapping our heads around, around it. John, what drew you to the, to the subject of sort of kindness and, and empathy as a filmmaker? Well, I don't know that I would have thought about it um, in earlier times, but I, um, like Kahani, um, was deeply affected by the growing sense of divisiveness in the country um, and feeling that there was this, this erosion happening all around us of, of civility. And I really um, was motivated to try to come at that problem from another direction and really look at the forces that are still keeping our lives uh, um, sort of functioning and the goodness that I still believe uh, exists in ourselves and our, in our communities. Um, and what is it like for the people who are trying to be forces of good in a time when there's such growing um, sort of hatred around them? Um, and so um, I reached out to uh, an organization that I have a prior uh, history of working with and, and getting benefiting from their support, a, a very large nonprofit health system um, that has a focus on this, on this as part of their, their sort of um, mission. And um, their response was an immediate interest in supporting and understanding the value of a documentary as being um, sort of a, a, a cultural touchstone that can um, promote and advance conversations on different on, on issues. And um, so we, with their support, um, I was able to really start putting this team together and, and um, did not, I worked very hard to not think about what the film would be about until I had a, a partner. So that's what I met Connie. So can you guys uh, walk us through a little bit how you discovered 
the subjects that you ended up working with? Were there a larger group that sort of got whittled down to the final film? Uh, my first time watching the film, I thought, you know, this would really make a great, epi almost episodic um, series of, you know, where we could look in on different communities and different uh, groups of people uh, undertaking sort of em empathetic action and building community through action. Um, but I'm sure there must have been like a lot of, or I'm hopeful anyway, <laughs> that there were a lot of opportunities uh, to talk to different groups of people. How did you guys end up finding your subjects and, and deciding upon them? Um, so there were many, 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 many incredible stories to choose from. But um, we in spent many months sort of wrapping our heads around what this film could be and what messages we wanted to tell. And so we came up, it's also overwhelming, like, you know, a film about kindness. We we knew pretty much out of the gate, we didn't want it to be, that it would have, we'd have to battle um, this um, sort of perception of kindness as being soft. So we didn't want it to be random acts of kindness, not that those are incredibly beautiful and valuable, of course, we wanted it to be about intentional kindness. So intentionality was a huge part of it. And to come to those, to start using, developing a filter almost um, to look for stories, we really um, asked ourselves and came up with six questions that became our North Star um, in terms of how we would look for stories. And those questions came out of months of reading, conversations, reaching out to people, um, you know, big thinkers, going down the rabbit hole all over, you know, the, the internet, et cetera. Um, and those questions um, are, how do we raise our children? How do we teach our children? How do we live and work together? How do we treat the sick and the dying? How do we welcome the stranger? And how do we lead? And we felt like, if we can find stories, not we didn't need a one-to-one -one correlation, but if we can find stories that addressed those questions in some way, then one, we will be sort of have the the chance of showing kind of sweeping a portrait of the human experience from birth to death. And also, um, also that it really would um, help us focus a little bit on the overwhelming task of the kinds of stories you wanted to tell. But we also knew that, um, you know, Charlottesville happened in the middle of all this. And we realized that it wasn't enough to ask those questions. We also had to acknowledge throughout the film the fundamental unkindnesses that are pervasive and a part of everyday life for so many Americans. So we also identified these unkindnesses. It's fundamentally unkind to have a lack of a safe place to sleep, fundamentally unkind to not earn a living wage, fundamentally unkind to not have access to health to healthcare. Racism, homophobia, sexism are all fundamentally unkind. And between those unkindnesses and these six questions, we sort of had this powerful lens through which we were evaluating stories. And then of course they had to be cinematic because this is a film um, and we have to look at stuff and they had to have, you know, compelling characters and, and, um, and sort of all fit. So there's actually, you know, we have all of these nine stories in the film. We shot um, more stories than that. And, um, those stories are available for people to see on our website, um, and they're equally powerful. We just couldn't include everything in our in our film, but all to, all told, we do think um, that they addressed these really important North Star questions and unkindnesses together. And just one other thing to add to my very long answer is just that, um, just in regards to your episodic. Uh, reaction, and I totally do understand that. Um, we do think every story is incredibly powerful on its own, but our hope is that, and we hope we succeeded, is that the sum of this film is greater than each of those parts because we think it's the way they speak in chorus together and kind of the, that chorus builds as the film unfolds, um, that they're really speaking to each other um, is like really an incredibly important creative decision that we may, made and hope that we succeeded with, so.
No, absolutely. I mean, my the thinking on the episodic side was that just that the stories could be self-contained, but you're right. It's not really a mosaic of individual stories. It's more of like a novel or a, uh, a sweeping portrait of our society or a social portrait, uh, much more than it is just like sort of individual pop-up things. Um, the other question I have about this is, you know, a lot of times when people make films uh, about an idea um, and they want to use real sort of real world social um, situations to illuminate that idea, they come from a hypothesis, then they find the evidence to prove the hypothesis is true. Um, this movie doesn't feel that way at all. It feels like you learned a lot from uh, the process of making it and found stories that sort of fit your questions, but you didn't come to it with answers you came to it with questions and I think that's very evident, but there is a sort of um, often a split in nonfiction filmmaking between portraits of institutions. Let's say, you know, Fred Wiseman of course is the classic example of that, looking at institutions one by one and people come in and out of them, but you're looking at the fixture. And then there's uh, portraits of people or por portraits of groups. Um, this one is both, which I found really interesting that you sort of show individuals within institutions, but you also follow the people who benefit from the kindness of those institutions or interact with them and you continue to follow them. You don't just see the intersection as a one-off experience. It's more of like a relationship that's been built. Can you talk about um, how you guys decided to frame organizations versus people uh, in the movie? Maybe John, you had a thought about that. Well, I, first of all, I, I, I just love listening to you talk about the film and, 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 and your, um, of how, what it made you think about. Um, and so, um, and I love the question. Um, we did, um, we did make a decision that we wanted to focus on organized efforts to lift others up, these intentional um, acts of, uh, of, of sort of, um, of, of community action. Um, and really, we started to realize that as we were meeting many of these organizations on the phone, on Zoom calls, whatever it might be, that we were starting to um, really see, and this word that Kahani uses of intentionality, we started to hear that word repeatedly from the people that we were having these conversations with. And so these, these, these sort of, these commonalities started appearing through the conversations that we were having before we ever started shooting. Um, and we wanted to elevate the, this idea that, that, that there are these forces that do make for, forces of good, that do make for a healthy community. And it became important to us um, to focus on that at this time when there were, as we keep referring to, this crumbling, the sense of things crumbling around us. And there was some writing that we came upon, uh, one, one essay by David Brooks in particular in the New York Times, where he talked about these forces of civility that if those start eroding, then we're really in trouble. Um, and that, you know, in the political sphere, that can all be happening. But when, if you start getting into um, the, the sort of the activities of daily life, where if you come to a crosswalk and somebody just is going to plow right through that doesn't give a damn, if you have the right of way, they are thinking only of themselves. Um, and we're really in trouble. And there are people who worry that that's a, a direction that we are headed. Um, so we really wanted to focus on people who are leveraging the, the, the power of, 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 of st local, state, and government resources, you know, and using them for as a force of good and doing it really well. And that kindness is at the heart of how they deliver those services. So if you think about the Center for Discovery in upstate New York, servicing hundreds, if not thousands of people with complex abilities, you know, they're reimbursed through insurance and through state and federal programs. They're not doing anything that isn't happening elsewhere. We just found that they have an overall philosophical approach that's worthy of a spotlight being shown on it because it's, it's sort of government at our best. Um, and it's, and it's, 
this it's human nature to help others at its best. There's so much that focuses on the individual act and there's so much that magnifies the individual act and you know the uh, social media is really really good at that. And so there's enough of that being sort of elevated. We wanted to focus on these organized efforts. And every single um, story um, is, is backed up with a huge amount of research, not done by us, but we were comfortable telling those stories because uh, others had already had also noticed from very different perspectives, academic or whatever it might be, that the work that's happening here is really consequential. What makes it consequential? So we knew that it, the stories were vetted in a sense by, by independent you know, organizations. Um, and so we're really, you know, we're very comfortable saying, you know, look at these as models for how, you know, you, you can really do good in your community. And I'm going to guess, I'm going to guess that this um, philosophy that you're bringing to the act of filmmaking also served you really well in post-production and editing um, as you tried to find a way, like Kahani said, to sort of interweave these stories and create a whole that's more inspiring and greater than some of its parts, which are great in and of themselves. Um, can you talk, uh, Kahani, a little bit about the process of working together on editing the film uh, now that you've narrowed down your subjects to these sort of vetted and really wonderful stories, how did you guys come together around how to tell the story itself? Um, well, I think, you know, like you would approach any film, you're really looking for um, characters that people can connect with, stories where there's something at stake. And so a few of our stories, uh, you know, just due to op the opportunities we have, the access we had, the relationships developed, um, presented themselves as stories that could kind of become the armature of, of, the, of the film to wrap other things around. And so a few of these stories, um, you know, were, uh, I don't want to say worthy is not the right word, but warranted multiple chapters because there's an ongoing thing. There was something you might be curious about that you come back to wondering how is that person doing? Other stories as meaningful, but you could tell them really in one, one chapter. Um, we did a lot of work in the edit room. Our masterful editors, um, you know, did a really incredible job sort of creating, I think, a real, a really poetic edit. Um, we originally, be, you know, it was every story had multiple chapters and you were like ping ponging all over the place. And it was a, an overwhelming experience. You didn't know who you were talking to. We really had to work hard um, to make sure that, you know, we had the, you know, we were reducing each story down to its essence, like a like a sauce, you know? And what is that essence? And is that essence best experienced in one chapter, two chapters, three chapters? And that's how we got to that. And, and the way, um, we, you know, there's a little bit of um, an interesting that thing that I'm proud of in this where, you know, over a little bit of time, we start passing the baton organically from one story to another as a way of introducing and segueing into the next, Thing. And also as a way of saying, like, these are all connected, like this story might take place in Amarillo, but we're hearing someone from Boston or from Alaska talk about it and talk about the issues here because the, those issues affect their community where they are. And let's go over there and see what that is. And that's all done in the edit room, you know, so it really was an incredible, uh, incredibly challenging you know, there was like a um, a beautiful mind situation going on on the on the wall of the edit room, trying to, you know, we shot 400 hours of footage for um, a, a movie that's 97 minutes without the credits, and so um, you can imagine whittling them, whittling it down and down and down to their each story's essence was the, you know, initial challenge, and then how to weave them together so that. They, they, they sort of fuel each other was the next editorial challenge. And so, um, you know, the result is, is the film and uh, we're really excited about it. 
Um, Kahani, can you, last time we saw you here at the festival, though, it was probably, you know, watching a movie, but you were here with uh, Joe's Violin, which of course was, uh, went on to be nominated for uh, Best Documentary Short uh, Academy Award. Um, and that film also, you know, resonated, I think, a lot for our audience because of its approach to sort of the, of an intergenerational uh, a- empathetic understanding brought together through, you know, the power of giving and the power of music. Um, did that film influence your decision to make this one? And then maybe both of you, after Kahani answers that, um, can talk a little bit about how making this film may have impacted your own approach to empathy and understanding. Um, well, first of all, I just want to say that screening of Joe's Violin at Montclair Film Festival. I had such an, you know, an amazing run with Rafaela and, and everyone involved in that film. That was my absolute favorite moment screening experience of the whole, you know, incredible run with that film. So thank you to you and Montclair Film for making that really just like a magical community oriented, you know, visceral experience. It was incredible. Um, I I will never forget it. So thank you for that. Um, In terms of, you know, Joe's violin, I, I think that as a person, I am very much of a you know, uh, I believe in, I don't, I, I do believe in like the essential goodness of people. I just, it's just my whole life. I have felt like that. I, I had examples in my parents of, of kind and giving people. I had a mom who would, you know, see a construction worker working without gloves on a cold day and would literally like take off her own and run over there and give them. And I was a little kid, I was embarrassed, but as an adult, I just think that's inc- amazing. Um, and, um, so I am compelled by telling those kinds of stories that highlight, um, the, the goodness of people. I think, you know, often, and I think, you know, kindness is seen as like, and is seen as like kind of a soft thing. People don't, I actually think it's like a very powerful tool. And I think, um, I am compelled by telling stories that, 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 highlight that aspect of humanity. And here I was presented with an opportunity to do that in a feature length film, you know, and when I got hired, we didn't know even that it was gonna be multiple stories. We arrived at that, but suddenly, you know, it became this opportunity to explore the thing about, one of the things about humans that I that I am moved by the most. And so, I don't remember what your original question is, but, <laughs> I, but I felt like um, you know the opportunity was incredible, and it definitely uh, it, it spoke to a lot of my my um, it was in my wheelhouse, like it spoke yeah. to my instincts. So I'm, I'm so happy for the chance, John. For you, was your own approach to sort of empathy and and understanding uh, transformed by making this film, or uh, was it a realization of something that you already had inside of you? Um, what a great question, Erin. And I, I, I think the best way I can answer it, Tom, is to say that um, there's not a person in this film that ever thought they would be in a documentary. They didn't think that they were doing anything that was so special that it would be in a, you know, that the cameras would, would want to capture it. Not one, um, and but I I think you'd agree that they're great documentary subjects, um, and I I think that a it reinforces this idea that everyone um, you know the, the human experience is is remarkably you know vast and varied and that. You know, there's 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 a there's an interesting story. You just have to listen. You have to you have to ask the right questions. You have to show interest, and you have to listen. Um, so, but I I think in terms of, of of empathy, what it definitely made me aware of is that, and what we really want, I hope we hope people respond, is that it's not that they have to say, oh, we're going to, I watched this film and I want to give some support to that refugee resettlement program in Anchorage. We don't, that would be great. But that's not the response we're hoping for. What we're hoping for is that we make them, we help people to look 
at their own community in different ways. That they see that there is, you know, a social service agency that is that is helping people, you know, Meals on Wheels, you know, that it is, it is, you know, anything that's helping people that are differently abled in their communities, that they look at a homeless person in a different way. Um, and that the people who are doing the work in their community to help the homeless are not looking for that pat on the back. They're just compelled to, as we say all, all the time, lift somebody else up. So it's just an awareness. If that's all that we do is make people recognize that, you know, I live in a community that's filled with people who are making the choice to lift somebody else up. I want to help them. I want to make sure that they are taken care of so they can they don't burn out, they can keep going. We all learned this in COVID. We, you know, the, the, the communities that were just devastated, the frontline workers never thought that they would be, you know, thought of as heroes, get applause at seven o'clock and banging pots and pans. You know, we became aware that we cannot survive without them. So, you know, I think that there's some parallel to that and what we're hoping and how people, you know, what we, what we hope people will think about. We, you know, changing hearts and minds, you know, that's, that's what we have the privilege of doing. Yeah, I took away a lot of, of hope, hope from the movie that, you know, even uh, the fact that I, I as an individual can't dedicate, you know, 24 hours a day of my attention to the work of others because I have my own work to do. Um, not just at the film festival, but in my community, like you said. Um, and to know that there's you're not alone and that there's a network of people out there. Um, I really think film can be so beneficial to people in making something like that universal, um, that feeling of hope. And um, I think you guys really accomplished that in, in this movie. D that said, do you think, you know, one of the things that's um, absent from the film is a direct political critique of the current environment, and because it changes literally every five minutes, unbearably, um, I'm wondering if you know you made the conscious choice. This is my sort of penultimate question for you before I, my final question, but you made the conscious choice to remove any sort of temporal, political, uh, um, direct reference. It's indirect, like you said, through the questions about what makes decency or what makes um, kindness happen. Um, but there's no real confrontation directly with the political moment uh, in my thinking, other than uh, embracing the good that you found in other people. Obviously that's a choice. Um, can you, was it simply because you didn't want to dignify it? It was too temporal, too fixed in time and changing so fast. What was your relationship to current events in, in making this movie other than a, a guide star philosophy? Philosophically, excuse me, philosophically. Well, I think we'll probably both um, want to contribute to that. Um, I, I will say that it's everything that you just said, um, that we did not want to fix the film in time. Um, the unkindnesses that Kahani t spoke about early, earlier um, have been um, eternal in American society. And that was very important to us um, to address issues that are ongoing, um, and um, I hope that we eventually, as a society, um, are, are better. Um, we, that we are uh, better angels of our souls, um, you know, sort of prevail. Um, and we feel that um, the film. We say in, in our language that we use to explain what the film is. The first line of that is made in response to the times we are living in. Um, and so uh, that is as far as we are comfortable um, going because we feel that that phrase alone um, says it all. Kahani, did you have thoughts on that? Well, I, I was just going to say, I think as does the, um, the tagline on our poster, if ever there was a time for kindness, you can see that line and do with it what you want, but I think that it is um, uh, very hard not to, you know, it would be very hard to remove that from the political atmosphere that we are living in. That being said, um, you know, we don't know who anyone voted for in our film. We never asked them that, you know, 
uh, would we have made this film, you know, years earlier, even though all of these problems existed years earlier? Like, I don't think so. I think we were very motivated by the time starting two and a half years ago when we were doing this and things were really, um, you know, feeling you know, the level of concern was deep and remains so. But, um, but we also feel like uh, the essential goodness of people or the desire to lift someone is nonpartisan. That really should be experienced, felt, seen by anyone and everyone. And um, so, you know, we, we uh, it, it was a choice not to go straight at it and preach to the converted, um, you know, in our film, because it really is for everyone and about everyone. And then, and, you know, um, it is about who we, you know, we were, we were always said to each other, like that we wouldn't, you know, we hope we make this film that people see it and they'll be like, this is who we are. Like, this is who we are, not that, you know, so it, maybe it is about this is who we are. Or maybe it's about who we can be, but, but we just think that it really, our intention is to, for it to be a portrait of this whole country. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think, depending on who you are and what your bent is, you will uh, experience it different ways. Uh, my final question for you guys today. So uh, what's next for the film? Um, congratulations on finishing it in probably the worst year uh, for film <laughs> distribution in history. Um, I'm just wondering if you guys <laughs> have, plans, have plans for what's next and how we can, as an audience, tell our friends and family uh, how to find this movie and continue to help carry it forward in the world? Well, depending on when people watch this, um, uh, the, the film is opening uh, in virtual cinemas on uh, October 16th. Um, and so the list of all the theaters that people can um, you know, access the film uh, through is at theantidotemovie.com. Uh, um, and so we hope that this starts spreading, uh, that people are able to, to um, not only at your wonderful Montclair Film Festival um, see the film and access the film that way, but beyond um, through virtual cinemas. And, uh, and then it will be on major streaming services uh, starting in November. Um, so, and, and those being you know, the, the, the obvious list of, of all the major um, Pay, uh, sort of um, streaming. TVOD. TVOD. <laughs> yeah. The usual round of suspects. I also just want to add one thing where um, not only for our website, theantidotemovie.com, um, you can see where else you can uh, watch the movie, you can watch the trailer, but you can also see four other uh, stories that we filmed um, that we um, made into singular shorts that are all incredibly powerful. And you can also uh, get involved. And so there's ways through our website, should you be so inspired by seeing the film, to go to the website and find out what you can do in your community. Um, so there's some incredible partnerships we have. And um, we hope, you know, we, we hope everyone will uh, enjoy the film and, and be inspired to visit the website and, and, and uh, you know, see what they can do. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, I'm so proud that we can bring this film to our audiences here in Montclair. I wish you guys both the greatest success. Um, again, your work always has a home here at the Montclair Film Festival, and we're so grateful for the opportunity to share this movie, uh, especially in these times, as you say. I think we, you know the election coming up, and there's a lot of anxiety out there. I think it's a really hopeful message. So thanks for bringing it to us, and congratulations. Thank you. We love the Montclair Film Festival. <laughs> thanks. Thank you, John. Thank you. Bye, Tom. Bye, Thank guys. Thank you. Bye.